Hi everyone, welcome to Tall Tales. This is part of Spring into Storytime at Wexford Libraries. My name is Karen Tompkins and I love stories. I love reading books too, but I especially love the make-believe. Making ordinary things very extraordinary. That's what I'm going to do for you today and for the next few weeks. If you would like me to make something in your life where you live extraordinary, please get in touch. You'll find the details on the Wexford Libraries page. Maybe you'd like to write a story and I can turn it into a tall tale. Well, today's tall tale is about the King and Queen of Duncannon Fort. Mm, bet you didn't know there were a king and queen there. Well, there were in my imagination. You see, my nanny and granddad, they lived in Duncannon Fort. My granddad was the caretaker and I spent so many summers and happy weekends playing in the fort as a playground. Can you imagine? This is a photograph of me and my nanny. Sadly, she's no longer with us, but this is her on my wedding day. And she really is and was a queen. I hope you enjoy this story and I hope that the tall tales of Wexford will make you close your eyes and use your imagination and believe the make-believe. Until next time, enjoy! <laughs> The King and Queen of Duncannon Fort. Hmm, yes, I shall wear the imperial gold crown, along with my purple silk prom dress. I've been told to wear purple and gold. Why ever I do not know. Servants, fetch me my things at once. Hurry up! Go, go, go! It was a busy morning in Belgravia Palace. Queen Monica Jane was getting ready for another of her royal visits. Today, she was coming to Ireland, to the southeast, in fact, to Duncannon in County Wexford. Queen Monica Jane had been invited to come and stay at Duncannon Fort. Oh, how she loved visiting other beautiful, stately homes and castles. In fact, Queen Monica Jane spent most of her time jetting around the world, being pampered and having her servants bow at her feet. She loved it. She just adored being an important queen, speaking only to important people, not those regular, ordinary people in her kingdom or her servants. Oh, no, no. She enjoyed getting to know other royal families around the world. They were the only people worth talking to, in Monica Jane's opinion. That's what being a queen was all about, wasn't it? As she sat at her dresser, while her maid brushed her hair over and over. Will you mind the knots in my hair extensions? Queen Monica Jane reread the invite she had received, still a little bit puzzled. Let me see, what does it say? Dear Queen of Belgravia, that's me, we have heard all about you and how you like to travel to nice kingdoms all over the world. Oh, yes, I do. We kindly invite you to our kingdom in County Wexford, from our home in Duncannon Fort. We claim the majestic Hook Peninsula as our own. We enjoy strolls on Began Bun and Curraclough Beach. In summertime, we visit Enniscorthy Castle. Ooh, they have a summer house. We watch the sun set on Cahore and Kilmore. Hmm, very unusual names. Please be our guest in this, the most noble of counties. P.S. Don't mind Nero as you enter through the gates. His bark is worse than his bite. From Phyllis and Peddy. Why didn't they sign themselves as king and queen, wondered Monica Jane. Mm, I suppose us royals drop the titles amongst ourselves. Oh, they sound so rich, though, and powerful. They own all that land and they live in a fortress. They must be really worth protecting. Very high society, this Peddy and Phyllis. I like the sound of them. And who's this Nero fellow, she wondered. He sounds like an emperor. Exquisite! Monica Jane imagined the all-you-can-eat buffets, the midsummer garden parties in Duncannon Fort, high society balls with the great and good, military salutes, royal outings. Ah, I'm so important! Where's that butler of mine? Cotton! Chipped up! Many hours later, 
the royal carriage, along with lots of other carriages carrying Queen Monica Jean's 15 suitcases and her hair straighteners, arrived at Duncannon. It wasn't quite what she expected. A small, beautiful, sleepy village. Her people didn't really take much notice of her. Two fishermen gave her a wave as they stood by the pump up the street, and a little girl with ringlets stuck out her tongue at them. But where is everyone, Carlton? Did you did you ring ahead to say I, Queen of Belgravia, H or H, Monica Jean, is arriving? Oh, I did, ma'am, but they didn't have a phone, so I left a message in the village post office, innit? Queen Monica Jean was none too impressed with her butler at that very moment. Finally, the carriage arrived at the gates of Duncannon Fort. Monica Jean sat upright. Oh, she liked the look of this castle. A fortress overlooking the sea. It was so commanding, so powerful. Oh, yes, they better clear that beach so I can bathe later. Now, where are the palace guards and the welcoming committee? Literally, where are they? Ah, Monica Jane, tis yourself, said the woman standing at the other side of the gate. My God, you brought everything but the kitchen sink. Come on, the kettle is on. Tell them fellas to bring the horses up onto the square with our donkey and we'll feed them and rest them all. Hmm, she's a cheeky one. Not even addressing me by my title, thought Monica Jane. I'll have a word with Queen Phyllis about this when I meet her in the great hall. And did she say donkey? As Carlton the butler escorted Monica Jane out of her carriage, she froze in horror. What, what, where's the red carpet? What, what, what is this? Doesn't exactly look like a castle from the inside. Come in and don't be fussing, girl. It was that woman again. I'm Phyllis, and this is my husband, Paddy. We can't believe you actually came here. You're very welcome. Quite shocked, Monica Jane did as she was told and took a seat at the very ordinary kitchen table. She was handed a plate of jam sandwiches and a mug, yes, a mug of tea. Monica Jane sat and took in her surroundings. Hung on every wall were beautiful pictures, painted by Queen Phyllis. Well, at least that's something they had in common. Then there was Phyllis's fishing rod. Apparently she was great at fishing and angling. Phyllis told her she was a dab hand at knitting Aran sweaters, while Monica Jane explained her fondness for tapestry. But when she saw that Phyllis sewed shoes and made clothes from flower sacks, she was rather taken aback. What kind of queen does that, she thought. Now I'll show you where you'll be sleeping, said Phyllis. The sheets have been aired by the range so they're lovely and fresh. The army blankets are warm but itchy and mind your toes on the hot water bottle. Oh, and if you need to go to the toilet or if you want a bath, you have to go into the officer's mess across the square. It's paper toilet roll, so you know yourself. Go easy. Speechless. Monica Jane nodded. Was this some kind of mix-up? A joke? No. She'd had enough. This trip to the kingdom of Duncannon was absolutely not what she had in mind. Suddenly she heard a commotion out on the fort square. Nero was missing. This was a big deal, apparently, and everybody would have to help in finding him. Reluctantly, Monica Jane agreed. This Nero fellow sounds like the real leader and emperor around here. He'll understand that I'm regal and royal and very important and I shouldn't be drinking tea from mugs. Yes, I'll help find him, even though I shouldn't have to. I am a queen. She commanded her royal guards to round up the riders. Phyllis and Paddy, you can accompany me in my carriage. Don't spare the horses. We must find Emperor Nero. They searched in Tintern Abbey, Johnstown Castle, Hookhead, Berry Carrick, on board the Dunbrody famine ship and the Salty Islands. Until they finally found Nero in the National Opera House, singing, or should I say barking, along to his favourite mezzo-soprano. Everyone was overjoyed to find the beloved guard dog of Paddy and Phyllis. They were so grateful to the wonderful Monica Jane. But she wasn't so happy. The carriage journey back to Duncannon was a long one. And Nero sat beside Monica Jane, resting his head on her lap and slobbering all over her silk dress. He was also prone to a few sneaky farts and smiled every time it happened. Back at Duncannon, Monica Jane couldn't bear it any longer. Look, I really shouldn't have come here. I thought you said this was your kingdom and you were a king and queen. You tricked me. I could have you arrested for this. I'm leaving before sunset. Carlton, load the carriages. Why did you lie to me? I thought you said this was your kingdom and I was expecting a royal welcome. But it is my kingdom, said Phyllis. Our kingdom, Paddy and I and everybody else who's lucky enough to call County Wexford their home. But how can you rule over all of this and you don't even wear a crown or a cape? And how can you call yourself a queen? 
Phyllis was smiling. She explained to Monica Jane that Paddy was simply the caretaker of Duncanon Fort. That's where they lived and raised their family. It was their home, their palace. What Monica Jane didn't know was that Phyllis really was a true queen. She was an important woman who worked tirelessly for her family, using her endless talents, fishing, painting, sewing, knitting, just to make ends meet. And the ends always met in the end. She saw hard times and sad times, but she kept going. She offered kindness and encouragement and her door was always open. She treated everyone the same. No, she didn't wear a crown. Instead, she wore a coat of faith and courage and a smile on her face. Now that's noble. Monica Jane stayed in Duncanon Fort that night and the next night and the next. In fact, she became great friends with Phyllis and Paddy. As for Nero, he was invited along with his owners to visit the palace at Belgravia. He broke a few statues and chandeliers, though. He weed in the royal fountains. He ate all the food at the royal ball. And he might have accidentally buried Monica Jane's crown under the apple trees. She just laughed, though. She never had so much fun in all her life. The people of Belgravia loved the new, fun, kind Monica Jane. Thank you, Phyllis, she smiled. Or should I say... Queen Phyllis of Duncanon. You might not have a title or a crown or riches of gold, but you've taught me more than you'll ever know.